welcome. Um, so I'm going to talk about space, how leaders grow, and you're probably thinking, what, what does that really mean? And Robert, who I met last night, uh, Richard, who I met last night, has been taking the mickey out of me about NASA and spacecraft and Star Trek. It's not about that, so if anyone expected that, you can say, slip out now. What, what do people think, what does space mean to people? What, what, might, what might I be about to talk about? Pardon? Mental space. Mental space. Any other thoughts or ideas or images come to mind? The of green of the mountains or the hills anyway. It um, reminds me of natural nature space. Mm. Natural space. Breathing room. Say again. Breathing room. Like breathing room. Mm. Breathing room, yeah. Oh. yeah. Space. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a, one of the things about space is it can mean something very grand and, and existential and then something very, very practical. Any other thoughts? Protected space. Protected something space. Something uninterrupted. Being unconstrained, in other words, there are, aren't burdens, whether mental or physical. So, um, I'm going to start um, by showing you some holiday snaps. <laughs> now, can it, does anyone know where that is? South Africa, did someone say? Yeah. Yeah, quite, quite close. Serengeti. Serengeti is very close. So, um, I'll spell you that, but uh, I'll, show you, <laughs> I'll show you the cute giraffes. Right, right so Kenya, right, actually. Right? Uh, and we should all know because it's where we all um, started. Right? It's uh, the Rift Valley where humanity, modern humanity, first uh, lived. Uh, and when I went there, I was struck by this incredible sense of space. And I suspect, <laughs> pulling on my psychoanalytic training, that that lodged in my unconscious and led me to then later on be thinking about what I'm going to talk about. Um, what's interesting is that the human beings that um, began their, li their, their lives in, in, in the Rift Valley about 200,000 years ago, and that's about 1,000 generations, which isn't that long if you stop and think about it. Like we, all, we, we know three or four, right, in our own lives, so 1,000 generations. Interestingly, um, for 950 of those generations, people lived pretty much the same. Right? They, they had a little bit more language, a bit more, some more rituals, better tools. But effectively, somebody who lived for the first, in the 950th generation of humanity would have completely recognised the world of the first generation of humanity. And then everything speeded up right? and became more intense. Um, this is that, that uh, a map of how <coughs> humanity is spread out across the, the world. Um, but you can see that, you know, for, for about ha over half, some people would say three quarters of, of, of our species history, we just stayed there where, where, where those pictures were, should, were, were, were in the Rift Valley. We then spread out, and as we now have conquered pretty much every corner of the world, we had to kill some Neanderthals along the way, but eventually we became the, the human race. Um, now, if you take a typical eight-year-old's um, life, and you use that as an allegory, for the first 75 years of that person's life, humanity was like that. Right? Hunter-gathering, smallish tribes, some, some settling, but often nomadic, um, very simple life, uh, and crucially, a life lived in this what for them must have just been literally limitless space, right? They, they, they would have had all this huge uh, environment around them. Ne never thinking that they could ever master it or conquer it, but, you know, jump on a, a plane. Um, only in the last year of that eight-year-old's life would uh, cities have begun to fall. 
Only in the last year did, did, did we get around to inventing the wheel right, and writing. In the last six months of that eight-year-old's life, we made a printing press which took books and leaflets out from like a, tiny, like a minuscule elite to a tiny elite. And then in the final six weeks of her life, the Industrial Revolution, in the last week, television, in the last few days, mobile phones, and in the last 24 hours, Google, Facebook, etc. Right? So in terms of humanity, this modern world that we all live in and take for granted has come about literally overnight, right, if you use that metaphor. So what? Right? Well, what it means is that e evolutionarily, we're not designed for the world we live in. We're not designed for, for this thing that happens to us now. We're actually designed for somewhere where there is, in all sorts of ways, limitless space. So, when I was thinking about this, and I, you know, the, the point of doing this talk in a way is that I'm writing a book and I thought, what a brilliant chance to come and explore my ideas and then <coughs> talk, right? So I, I'm kind of rushing the ideas so that we do have time to talk. There's also a survey that hopefully you'll fill in um, halfway through. Um, the basic idea then became this. So we've become the first generation in 1,000 generations of human beings who, rather than having the need to fill space, have the need to create it. Um, and as I said, I, I can't remember now what came first, my kind of looking at the Valley or my third thoughts about space when I was coaching. But um, I do remember a kind of multinational coaching program. Uh, the, one of the innovations was that we wouldn't meet in our offices or their offices, we'd meet in a place that was meaningful to them. And this guy called Paul wanted to, meet on a, wanted to walk along the South Bank in London. And as we were walking, he was a very typical, so he was in charge of the supply chain, or, you know, senior in the supply chain for this company. And um, very down-to-earth, kind of typical, kind of male manager, really. Uh, and he struggled with uh, not having enough time to think, right, about deeply about anything, or st more strategically. He struggled with getting to know people properly, both wider in the organisation in terms of networking, but also in terms of his own team. Did he really know them? Not really. It was all quite superficial and tactical and transactional. Um, he felt that he kind of dominated meetings sometimes. He got impatient and just start telling people what to do, even though he knew he shouldn't because he'd been on a course that said he had to be a coaching manager. Um, and he, he just didn't really feel that he had space. And so I, I, we were talking about space, and then, you know, he went off and I went back to work and, and then about a month later I met him again uh, and this time he chosen to go fly fishing with his dad, right? So I went off to Hampshire thinking like, what a great job I've got, right? And uh, we caught this trout, or he caught the trout and he came home with me to Islington, which was all very nice. And, and then we had a little walk after we'd done the fishing and he said, you know, I, I keep thinking about that idea of not, about not having a space. And I thought, hmm, I've got to scrap this itch, right? I've got to think about this more, there's something in it. So I started to kind of try and develop what I was thinking, and <coughs> I had a workshop with a lot of high potential managers uh, from a travel company, and I put together the, the three slides that I'll show you now, which are the, the three slides from, this was about a year and a half ago, probably. Um, so the idea is space at work, modern life, particularly work, fills any space indiscriminately. This means most leaders feel overwhelmed and not masters their own destiny. A leader must therefore consciously push back and create space. Why? Deeper self-insight and sense of purpose, better strategic and creative thinking, richer relationships, and delivering what really matters. Therefore, you can't deliver your best or really grow as a leader unless you first create space. And that then, from feedback from those people, and I presented it in a few other places, and colleagues and friends or whatever, led me to this kind of second insight. So the first insight was the one about, you know, we're the first generation, a thousand generations, to actually have to create space. No one, no one else has, has ever had to do it in the history of humanity. The second kind of pillar of the book, if you like, is this. Before you set out to grow as a leader, you must first create the space that you will grow into. Creating space is the a priori task that unlocks optimal personal performance and development. So in other words, what we try and do, I think, is say, well, I'm going to perform better. I'm going to change this thing. I'm going to develop it <coughs> in this way. When we're already overwhelmed and too busy, right? Well, how could that possibly work? Then there's, there's an interesting story I was telling um, the guy who was doing mindfulness before about a, a monk, which I'm not going to bore you with, but it's an ap apocryphal story about basically, you know, if you feel something, something's already full, you can't put anything else in it. 
right? So it's a very simple point, but we ignore it, right? So you know, you've got to learn how to do strategic thinking. Oh, great! I'll, I'll do it. How do I do it? And then we wonder why people don't actually develop in the way that we're hoping. Um, so that led me then on to the, you know, a kind of provisional model, if you like. So first, create space. Why? To think, which somebody said uh, before. To do. To feel. To relate. And to be. So that's why we have to do it. If we, if we want to do those things more, that's great. And we all know there's a million interventions that can help people do all those things. But first you've got to create a space to do that. Um, so then I kind of looked at well, what, what might that mean if you unpacked it so we think it's kind of reflect, discover, strategize, plan, which takes you into doing, focus, deliver, review, self-awareness, kind of processing emotions, opening up, networking, connecting, growing, balance and purpose. The thing is that if you look at these 15 things, you can't do those things without first creating space. So, what I've got now is a, is, a, is, a, is a little inventory that I'll pass around. And we'll stop for five minutes. Don't Anybody really intuitive and done it already? Yeah, have you? Do you mind chewing your skull? <laughs> yes, sure. Uh, Seventy. Seventy. What was the lowest uh, subtotal? Eleven. Seventy six, you had no, seventy. Seventy. Yeah. Near of the green line. Well, look, we've probably got enough. Things. So I've no idea because, uh, as I say, my lack of um, expertise in psychometrics. Like whether that initial, you're the first people to ever do it, apart from my wife, actually. Um, and uh, I don't know whether that. Uh, obviously, it could mean that people are all quite similar and are kind of in the middle ish. So people create some space, but you know, not 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 as much as they might. Um, or it could mean that there's something kind of wrong with the with the survey that means that it's all bunched like that. So I'm hoping that John from OPP will tell me which which of it is later. Um, <coughs> of all those people who have now got a score, put your hand up if you think, yeah, I got that score and I'm happy with that level of space in my life. That's cool for me. What was your seventy? What was yours? 
Definitely 60. Okay. Um, put your hand up if you looked at your school and thought, hmm, actually, I would quite like a higher school. I would like more space. Okay, so, what, well, 80% of people probably. Um, so, um, when I was kind of developing this, I thought, okay, I'm going to that conference with uh, Rob Bryan and talking about evidence, right? So, can I find some data that might support this? At YSC, we've got a database of 40,000 business leaders that we've assessed. So um, I took a thousand random reports from across the globe, uh, which were anonymized, and sat down and read them. And uh, our reports, generally speaking, have a profile, a, a list of development areas and a list of strengths. So I looked at the development areas to see whether there was a development area around the need for space. So these are relatively senior executives all around the world in the last three years. <coughs> and um, it wasn't just mention of space, it was, it was some of the kind of words that we came up with before, but stepping back, made more room for anything that seemed to be about creating more space. And 93% um, of those executives had a development need, and there's usually four or five in, in any report, had, they had a development need around the need to create more space. 58% around relate, 36 around think, 23 do, feel 17, and B7. I actually don't think that's truly reflective. I, th I think the, the nature of our assessments is that we don't, we're not looking at as much as we should possibly at feeling and, and being and purpose and all that. So, so I suspect that actually that those last two are, are, not, you know, are probably higher. But I think those three, where our assessments are very focused on their ability to relate to influence, <coughs> thinking obviously in all its manifestations and, and then execution, um, you know, that would be a pretty accurate, those top three I think are pretty accurate uh, portrayal of, of, a, of a, a kind of modern global executive. Um, so I'm just going to whisk through this so that we can actually have 50 minutes discussion. Um, well, so what, right? Well, what should we do about it? So the book... It's meat is five coaching stories that are kind of amalgamized and anonymized. And, uh, which just take the reader through a story, basically, about each of these executives who have a particular, they kind of overlap, but they particularly have a, a, a need in that area. It's full of, like, you know, hopefully very practical tools, tips, models, interventions, kind of thing that I'm sure you kind of do if you're coaches. Um, within the story. Um, but there's something else that's more fundamental, um, these three things, I think. Committing to your personal strategy, adopt the space mindset, and maximise your productivity. So in other words, what I'm saying is that, yes, you could look at, well, I want to think more deeply or more creatively or more strategically uh, or more collaboratively. How do I do that? And that hopefully there'll be some stuff in the stories around that. But actually, before you look at the specifics of creating space to think or do or be, you actually have to do something else, which is this. So, community personal strategy, it's pretty simple, but, you know, an amazing number of people that I work with don't do it. You know, they do, they'll do it for their business or the business unit and say, what's your personal strategy? And what, what do you mean? I just told you. No, 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 not about, uh, you know, sending more, more smurm off in, in, in uh, China. What's your personal strategy? Setting a goal, and, 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 and you know, the book goes into what, what, how you do that and, and what kind of goal you should have and how big they should be, etc. Drawing up a plan, you know, and then reflecting. Um, you, know, um, you know, what are the different elements of a plan? What resources are you going to... You know, so again, if you were looking at a business, you'd say, right, okay, I've got a, I've got a goal, what's my strategy? I'm going to do this and this, the, these steps. Um, in order to do that, I've got a timeline, what's realistic? What resources do I need to make that happen? You know, that's how people have to be thinking, right? What is, and that allows them to prioritise. Because people say, oh, we prioritise better or focus. Well, hang on, on what? You know, what am I prioritising? Because I don't really know. So that's the crucial first step. You've got to know where you're going. Um, adopting the space mindset is a whole series of kind of attitudes and assumptions. <laughs> you know, at all times, we're all going to be pushed to say all this, right? And sometimes we will have to, right? 
that interesting conversation yesterday about are we kind of servants or um, consultants, sometimes a client will say, no, this does have to be done now and you probably have to do it now. But the point is you should be constantly pushing back so that you're here. So yes, I'm sticking to my, to my ruthless goals because I know what they are because I did that last exercise. Instead of, no, I have to do this instead of as well. And my contention would be that, that many people automatically do this. So along comes a demand. They don't think about it. They don't think, is it important? Is it in my goals? Can I get away with not doing it? Can I give it to someone else? They largely think, oh, now I've got to do that and add it to the kind of pile of things to do. Yes, this can be good enough, as opposed to no, it has to be perfect. That's a very common thing we would work with people around. Yes, that can wait, versus no, it must be done now. All the time people said to me, you know, you've got to do this now. So why do I have to do it now? I've got, I've got a slot next Tuesday, I have to do it then. You know, people, people go, you know, my PA has a real problem with it. You know, what, what, you need to do it now. The, the client said the report has to be in now, but it doesn't. So to tell the client, I really can't do it till Tuesday. They really want it, will they phone me? They don't phone. They don't really need it now. Um, yes, it's okay to get things wrong, right? Versus, no, I cannot make any mistakes. You know, if, you're, if you have that compulsion to be, to be perfect and not make mistakes, then you're going to fill your life with stuff that is not actually um, very optimal. Yes, I have faith in myself versus, no, I am crippled by self-doubt. So, so part of this is to try and move people over here and to make this the default position instead of this. That, that the theory would be, would then free up time, space, mental energy, etc. And then finally, maximising your personal productivity. So th this is obvious, right? So, you know, you can't, it's not really you know, getting all metaphysical about creating space when actually you're just wasting loads of time because you're flipping between emails, writing reports, emails, phones people coming by your desk, right? There's quite a weight now of psychological evidence about multitasking being not a, good, not a very efficient thing. Um, so just making sure that people, you know, look at sleep and whether you're getting enough sleep, look at your daily rhythms. You know, are you better in the morning or in the evening? Plan your day accordingly. Uh, you'll be more efficient. Uh, multitasking, kind of don't do it. Uh, and and to-do management, how, how do you actually manage that list of... Because you still, you know, with the best will in the world, if you, if you read the book and think, wow, that's great, and you implement bits of it, you're still going to have a load of stuff to do, right? So how do you manage doing it? So that's the kind of core of the underpinning of how you might create space, and then, as I say, each of the stories goes into it in more detail. That's the point, to recap. You know, if you don't create that space, you're not going to develop in the, way, in the way that you want to. 